Jeff Schaefer, uh, the director of the Hale Institute. I will, I think, offer some comments that are in keeping with some of the things you've heard already. Um, my particular concern in the submission tonight is with the ruling class dogma that refuses to countenance boundaries or borders to anything. The rejection by our enlightened betters of the intuitive, politically constitutive, and historically universal fact of nas national borders is not an isolated act of merely geopolitical revolt. Rather, it is but one manifestation, a symptom among many, of a misbegotten form of thinking about human existence more generally. I speak of the late modern subscription to the notion of individual autonomy, to self-definition as central to personal identity, and to the refusal of all notions of givenness in normative context, such as the unchosen features of purpose and relationality in human being. The fashionable alternative now on offer is a human essence of isolation and rootlessness from which no obligation of loyalty to person or place may be deduced beyond loyalty to self, of course. Borders, boundaries, delineations, these are not just the framework of political society, but of human existence as such, and indeed of rationality itself. Boundaries are a matter of human life properly lived, of thought acknowledging its structure, of identity acknowledging its grounding in impassable characteristics. Yet the new man under design and development in our day is deemed free only insofar as he lives as a citizen of a world without borders, without preconditions, definitions, or limits. John Milbank, in an essay of about 20 years ago, presented an incisive and memorable description of contemporary liberalism's operative description of humanity. He offers that liberalism, I quote him, proceeds by inventing a wholly artificial human being who has never really existed and then pretending that we are all instances of such a species. This is the pure individual thought of in abstraction from his or her gender, birth, associations, beliefs, and also crucially an equal abstraction from the religious or philosophical beliefs of the observer of this individual as to whether he is a creature made by God or only material or naturally evolved and so forth. Such an individual is not only asocial, he is also apsychological. -psycho His soul is in every way unspecified. To this blank entity, one attaches rights." End quote. Because this vision disqualifies limits from pertaining to the individual, venerable and defining constraints on that individual, such as those present in religion, tradition, manners, law, among other things, are disputed because they act as hedgerows and fences. And this objection to a constraining cultural ambiance dovetails nicely with another plague on Western self-understanding at the moment, namely the phenomenon of oikophobia. What is that? This is a word long used in psychiatry, but Sir Roger Scruton adapted it for use in political philosophy, defining it as the felt need to denigrate the customs, culture, and institutions that are identifiably ours. Making a similar point, then Cardinal Ratzinger wrote that the otherwise commendable Western practice of self-criticism has devolved into what he described as a peculiar self-hatred that is nothing short of pathological. This is the posture of not just an ungrateful populace, but an apostate one, as it rages against the Christian roots of its civilization. Mark Shela, in his book, Resentment, presents, I think, the classic description of the apostate. The apostate, he writes, is one who is not primarily committed to the positive contents of his new belief and the realization of its aims. Instead, he is motivated by the struggle against the old belief and lives on for its negation. He is engaged in a continuous chain of acts of revenge against his own spiritual past. As a religious type, then, the apostate is therefore at the opposite pole from the resurrected. During the French Revolution, 
which is a paradigm case and template of apostate negation and boundary repudiation. Thematic was its effort to de-Christianize the country through maniacal level destruction of the symbols, practices, rituals, people, and places that represented Christianity. A notable illustration, I'd say with contemporary resonance, was the, de was the desecrating mob orgy carried out in the Church of St. Eustace in the symbolic and sacred space of the cathedral sanctuary. The directors of this obscene project understood that this brazen trespass was a means of cultural overthrow through transgressing what had been an impassable boundary. The sacred and the high was invaded, mocked, and brought low. A central cultural border was defied, and this was a calculated step in redesigning the nation. This is similarly the work in our day of pride parades and other grotesqueries inserted into the public commons of our nation. These work to tear down the boundaries of propriety and order, to erase the culture grounding polarity of and distinction between purity and filth, and otherwise to transgress or abolish the walls or interdicts that preserve community integrity. The Supreme Court's 2015 case of Obergefell versus Hodges is often described as the redefinition of marriage case, but just as well could be labeled a border abolition case as it amounts to the same thing. Justice Kennedy, writing for the court majority, purported to remedy the condition of same-sex couples, quote, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. As if all of human civilization through all time had collectively erected and maintained an arbitrary fence around marriage to keep out persons otherwise permitted into it. <clears throat> For the Obergefell court, the meaning of civil marriage was not a relevant point of exploration. And so Justice Kennedy and his colleagues approached marriage not as a, de a definite, meaningful, and thus bordered institution to be deferred to in the law, but instead stipulated it as mere, a mere status of government conferred dignity to which a fundamental right of access exists. And when the court concocted this abstract right of entry, the institution itself evaporated, which of course was the point. Likewise, with transgender or transsexual claimants celebrated rights to cross the boundaries presented by separated bathrooms, locker rooms, sports teams, and the pronouns of the other sex. Doing so overcomes not just, for instance, modest and convenient spatial separations, but more profoundly flouts the symbolic reinforcements of human meaning held and cherished by these boundaries. Likewise, by obtaining and celebrating cross-sex hormones and surgeries, they cosmetically defy and revile the boundary and the meaning that is the human body. All of these border crossings, let's call them, serve the audacity of asserting that human meaning itself is unstable and variable. Now even the fixity of male and female and the ontological limits that these are may not be acknowledged in polite company. And for some, not even during testimony given under oath before the Senate Judiciary Committee. For according to the new wisdom, commitment to liberty and equality entails that almost nothing has a given essence. Nothing is circumscribed. Nothing has a perimeter that distinguishes and excludes the category of woman included. Professor Carl, Carl Schneider, writing of the broader background trends, has observed how we have deinstitutionalized the family and ratified as family whatever relationships individuals choose to call one. In America, he says, all affinities are elective. That is, for us, family relationships are not aspects of reality, but matters of choice. People are unattached interest seekers who select. And when all affinities are elective is a formula working even at the level of the family, of course, it applies also to the patria, the nation. Here we might recall the etymological association of country and family. This has already been alluded to a couple of times. Patria and patrimony derive from the root pater, or father. Thus do we speak of fatherland. We also speak of our nation as home and homeland. 
And the Latin root of nation is drawn from natus, natio, and natione, to be born, and that which has been born. And on this vital matter of birth, or more specifically, births, we encounter another consideration of national concern manifestly associated with immigration incentives and decisions. Christopher Lash has indicted our epoch for its quickly diminishing sense of historical continuity, the sense of belonging to a succession of generations originating in the past and stretching into the future. We've now decided not just to reject our forebears, but a posterity. In acting this out, the West, like those in its cultural shadow, collectively has refused to maintain replacement level birth rates. Some years ago, Mark Stein uh, commented on the situation in Greece, a condition now approximated in many countries with a fertility rate of 1.3. As he, um, this is 10 grandparents, six parents, four children. This is the family tree turned upside down. As he put it, they can't mortgage the future there because strictly speaking, there isn't one. South Korea, you might know now, has a fertility rate of 0.78%. This sort of uh, national outcome is not an accident of unexpected consequences. It is instead an eyes wide open, collectively unified effort of national wrap up and deletion. It emerges from a defining commitment of that society and the too many others like it in the below replacement birth rate countries, ours included, that children are choices and to be avoided, that materialistic present orientation defines a life properly lived and the denial that we have a duty toward and a blessed participation in the presence and conditions of those who will follow us. Let us not imagine that the immigration discussion is dissociated from our materialistic presentism and aversion to reproducing ourselves. Another angle of consideration on our boundary aversion and deterioration, I teach a law and speech class in which we, among other things, consider the vacuous terms of modern libertine free speech doctrine. For decades, the Supreme Court has not only described and governed the polity defining standards of how speech and other expression is regulated in the United States, but has done so by stipulating a certain model of American social order from which it then deduces policy conclusions. And it so happens that the operable model is one of official agnosticism on community good. The philosopher Gerhard Niemeyer was one of the most articulate mid-century critics of this aspect of, of speech jurisprudence and of court rulings that prohibit and gut the community's self-preservation through its legal enactments. He targets the fact that the modern free speech doctrine knows of no distinction or criterion by which utterances may be recognized as either belonging to the circle of mutual loyalty or denying the basic community. To recognize standards and features of community life is impliedly to register a form of obligation, of loyalty, of deference, all things from which we now recoil as they impede liberty, so-called, a concept we are to understand as approximately a license to flail about without reference or submission to an order of truth. A society afflicted with this particular or peculiar condition, Niemeyer diagnosis, is incapable of confronting cultural enemies because it cannot officially designate them as such. How could it on this model? As a result, such a hamstrung and self-blinded legal order must, he says, either disavow its version of free speech dogma or resign itself to the idea that suicide is also a legitimate use of freedom. He summarizes that such a laissez-faire principle in the field of political ideas implies that community is essentially not an entity of mutual loyalty, public faith, and devotion to a common good, but a vast and loose network of little significance as a whole. Freedom of speech in the deviant form that he's critiquing implies that the community as such really has no moral demands to make on its members beyond the requirement that nobody should interfere with his neighbor's desire to express his ideas, whatever they may be. What then becomes of public discourse? What shared currency do we have to transact exchanges of explanation? 
apart from an acknowledgement of a shared world of the true, the rational, the good, that is held in common among the interlocutors. Communication is without grounding and thus unavailable. Chantal Del Sol prophetically warns, tomorrow violence will be the only form of social interaction we have unless we re-legitimize common certainties. But those common certainties are precisely the work and effect of a particular culture and its acts of cherishing and preserving that which is distinct to it. And herein resides a central task of the nation to which I'll now turn, finally. A culture instantiates and facilitates a particular way of being in the world and tethers us to the community that shares that way of being. But it is the nation, the commonwealth, that contains and enables that way of being, into which the citizens then are enveloped, educated, and directed. It is the nation that holds and, and passes on the patrimony whose origins long predate the persons now participating in it. I draw here from John Paul II in his book, Memory and Identity, an important pairing of words, by the way. When reflecting on the indispensable work of one's country, he emphasizes its provision of a context of stability for human experience through time. There is therefore what he calls the right of the nation to the foundation of its culture and its future. And in this, there exists a fundamental sovereignty of society which is manifested in the culture of the nation. America, of course, has maintained and contained and preserved a certain way of being that has, by preservation within its borders, been visible to the world as distinctly ours, warts and all. And it is appealed to and motivated millions who have migrated here, often at great sacrifice, because of their awareness of the vast difference between how life is organized and enacted within these borders and outside of them in other bordered polities. So we might ask then how the attractive interior side of our borders is to be maintained, and we hope refined toward improvements, without concurrently calibrating, among other things, who, when, and how many may enter. That is, how to balance whatever needs we may have for additions, as well as making hospitable allowances for asylum cases and the like, without inviting a kind of terminal upset terminal upset of national community and character. And this invites consideration um, pertaining not only to those who enter, but of designs for incentivized and pressurized assimilation of newcomers, so that cultural priorities in their specific forms here are maintained for those not only who are now citizens, but for future generations who will inherit the consequences of today's policies. The European authors of the thoughtful Paris statement uh, calling for a return of the culture of what they called the true Europe, wrote plainly, immigration without assimilation is colonization, and this must be rejected. We rightly expect that those who migrate to our lands will incorporate themselves into our nations and adopt our ways. This expectation needs to be supported by sound policy. But therein lies a quandary. In the terms of my lament tonight, assimilation to what? This is a difficult answer when America and the West more generally, on the fashionable account I've been critiquing, is nothing but a place where one can be and do whatever he wishes. The very idea of assimilation thus is as preposterous and offensive to our progressive conductors as is the idea of borders itself, and for similar reason. So here I'll finish. Our border challenge is not, in the first instance, and most basically, an isolated issue of lax law enforcement. It is rather one signified by a managerial class that vibrates to the idea and to the enactment of cosmopolitan detachment and cultural negation, to renouncing fidelity to our traditions and our home, or more fundamentally, to renouncing even the idea of home or of given truths and duties that guide and define person, family, community, and nation. Thank you.